So we're talking, we're going to talk for about 20 minutes or so and ask questions and then have a discussion all together. So what, do we, what kinds of commons really are there? And, and we can think of uh, maybe three types uh, that have some distinguishing characteristics that are a little different from each other. One are resource commons. Can you think of an example of a resource commons? Common pasture. Common pasture. What about uh, air and ocean things? Air, water, the oceans. Plants. Uh, plants can be common. Uh, yes, uh, resource commons. Land, you referred to land. Land is a, is a resource commons. We've seen over the last um, oh, 30 years or so a rise in something called the digital commons. Yeah, exactly. We've all been the beneficiaries of open source software in one way or another. And just the internet itself. Yeah. Uh, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. The internet is a digital commons. Then we have uh, social and cultural commons. And so you referred to uh, money, Janusz. So money is a uh, social commons. But we, democracy. Democracy can be a social commons. An example of a cultural commons could be uh, shared language. Right. And um, one of the things that we've seen, again, uh, this 30-year period, really starting about 1980, where uh, Thatcher and Reagan in particular were so key in this historically, of looking at the idea that, oh, we have these social ills or social problems, we're much better off applying the logic of the market. And so this uh, whole trend towards neoliberalism really began to move in. And, and, and so one of the key things that we saw that had certainly taken place historically, but came on steroids in our modern time is a concept called enclosure, which is the idea that uh, usually the private sector with the uh, support, uh, usually through legislation, of the public sector is able to commodify or enclose uh, the commons. And so, we certainly have seen this with regard to uh, land. We've seen it uh, with regard to even trying to recently in America control the uh, internet uh, through uh, regulation. And we see it in even the most bizarre ways in terms of uh, social and cultural commons. Sorry, I, no, you please. said to com um, the public sector helps the private sector commodify and what? Sorry, I'm enclose. In, in enclose. Yeah, sorry. enclose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oftentimes, I mean, you see this in, in often you've seen it in, in with places like China, mm -hmm. where a company or a corporation wants to move in, and there's all of this common land, and so the local jurisdictional body mm -hmm. passes legislation that enables the developers uh, to come in and, and claim that land, even though people might be using that land in a variety of ways for farming or pasture or whatever. We were talking earlier today that in India, as an example, the commons are uh, in India uh, referred to as wastelands. Uh, and it's an interesting use of language because you think of wastelands as not having uh, value mm -hmm. and, and thus anybody can use it that wants to uh, claim value or claim uh, some kind of upgrade. But 200 million people in India uh, exist from day to day through using uh, the commons, using these wastelands. And one of the challenges that we have all together in the world today is we have, over time, lost our way into uh, confusing what the meaning of value is and what creates value. 
So we've moved away from intrinsic value that exists in the commons to functional value that is measured in the private sector. So to give an example of this, if a forest is not on somebody's balance sheet, technically it has no value economically. It's, uh, it's extraordinary altogether. So unless it's uh, actively regulated by the public sector, uh, it uh, is in danger of becoming commodified by the private sector to say, hey, you know, let us take it over. So, I'm sorry, you may get to this, but I don't want to forget this question because sure. kind of the, whole, the whole thing hinges on it. Um, when you say it must be passed on undiminished to future gen generations, there seems to be, I guess, maybe an assumption behind that or, or, or something further behind that that I guess it's a point that could be argued, right? I sure, guess is what I'm saying. Sure. So, so can sure. you can you justify that further? Or yeah, uh, generally within the uh, framework of the way thinking is emerging about the commons, is that one of the part of the ethos or ethic of the commons is that it has a multi generational dimension to it, and so maybe I could just uh, contrast. The, uh, contrast this with uh, kind of thinking in the market. Would that be okay? Sure, sure. And if you're going to get to, you know, well, an elaboration of that, I don't, I don't want to take off track. But you need, are you? I'm done. You're done. Okay. <laughs> I mean, this is an important set of distinctions, and you're, you're talking about your interest in uh, sustainability. So we have the commons, and we have the market. Market thinking uh, dominates uh, our Western uh, orientation these days. So, the uh, generally, when we think of the commons, we think of stewardship. But with market-oriented organizations, are focused on ownership. And. With this kind of orientation, we're looking at uh, long-term uh, preservation. And uh, with this kind of orientation, we're looking at short-term utility. And, and, and for good reason. Go ahead, George. I just wanted to make a, a comment about the, the short-term uh, utility that uh, it, it doesn't come from uh, some uh, poor decisions or some evil minds, but it comes from the uh, inherent logic of capitalism that capital wants uh, mm -hmm. the flow moving fast so that we can make more profit on it. That's why we need to think in short term. Yeah, so, so the focus then becomes on shareholder returns and, and publicly, uh, certainly for publicly traded uh, corporations, where as the commons is looking really at uh, intergenerational equity, how do we pass on from generation to generation? so that our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, seven generations, as the Native Americans say, are able to enjoy the fruits of these, uh, of these commons. And uh, then there are just a couple more. Um, one is uh, a focus on sustainability. Because you have to have that if you're going to have intergenerational equity. But here, the drivers are, the logic is a focus on growth. And so then, uh, again, if you're focusing on growth, if you're focusing on growth, you, you seek to uh, expropriate the resources necessary to fuel that growth. And that's what's gotten us into our current dilemmas today. We're actually in a...
probably know this, uh, in a condition today that ecologists call overshoot, because we are extracting more resources than the Earth can generate in a given year, and we're, we're disposing of more pollution than it can purify in a year. So currently it's about uh, 1.5. We need one and a half worlds just to kind of make it from year to year, and we're on our we're on target for uh, two, two and a half worlds within uh, 20 years or so. Um, and so uh, we look at the common good here. And we look at private interest here. And uh, as well, we hear the modus operandi that enables us to achieve this is collaboration. Whereas here, it, it tends to be competition. So you referred earlier to the tragedy of the commons. And this is a, anybody hear this phrase before, tragedy of the commons? There's a famous article in 1968 by a biologist, Garrett Harton, who basically said, look, whenever you get people together to share a common resource, it degenerates into a tragedy. And he gave the example of each of us have cows. Each of us uh, have cows that we can put on a meadow. And so our tendency is going to want to uh, maximize our own returns by putting a maximum number of cows into the meadow to graze. And as a result, if we're all trying to do that, we will overgraze. And that commons that was a pasture for our cows now becomes a dust bowl, and that commons is now a tragedy. And that <coughs> article was very, very influential with policymakers, particularly in America, but also in the UK, that 12 years later really helped fuel, uh, it was a myth that helped fuel a, uh, a, a philosophical position that said the way to protect uh, commons from turning into a tragedy is by allocating it to the private sector. And so it became a justification for uh, being able to uh, privatize uh, not only facilities within the public sector, but resources that are in the commons. And so we ended up with uh, kind of perpetuating a, a system that, um, well, uh, I'll put it this way as an analogy. I was um, I spend a lot of time in Fiji, and on this island where I go to is a, is a sea crab that has two claws, but one of the claws is just huge, and the other one is uh, sort of <laughs> wilted and it kind of navigates with this big one claw. So we have a society today that has this <laughs> big one claw, and uh, that's not working. It's just not working. It's not sustainable altogether. Really, about, uh, still about that essay, did uh, uh, the author actually meant to critique common um, use of uh, natural resources, or was he misrepresented? Well, Garrett Hart admitted later that what he was really talking about was something called an open access regime. And um, uh, in 2009, uh, Eleanor Ostrom won the Nobel Prize in Economics, first woman to ever win the Nobel Prize in Economics, uh, for uh, spending 30 years of her life actually researching and being able to refute uh, Garrett Hardin and saying that uh, there are commons and what she called common pool resources that can be and have been throughout history successfully managed where there isn't a tragedy, where there is sustainability, whether there are fisheries in uh, Indonesia or irrigation systems in uh, Spain or potato farmers working together in Peru, or um, hundreds of examples. And there, uh, her, uh, 
classical book on this is called Governing the Commons. It's an old book, came out I think in 1990. Ostrom, O-S-T-R-O-M. Uh, and was groundbreaking in, in showing hundreds of studies under what conditions can commons work best. And this is very important. I think there are two things when, uh, uh, you know, when we look at the Occupy movement and how, what the promise is of a commons framework that could be uh, embraced here to uh, continue to increase its uh, potential and relevance for the larger society. There are, I think, two things come to me to bear in mind. One is to have clarity between uh, what constitute um, uh, public goods uh, and common goods. And under what sets of conditions can public goods actually become uh, common goods? And what Ostrom and her colleagues doing this research really helped us understand is there are a lot of potential commons, and some of them fail, and some of them are successful. And she went through years of trying to figure out why that was the case, and said at one point she had taken a year off from her academic studies Indiana University to examine once more all of the studies, uh, and there were hundreds, uh, to see what the patterns were. And she couldn't, she couldn't find the, the, the patterns. And she said she got enormously depressed, feeling that her whole career had been wasted. And then through some conversation she had with someone, uh, she zoomed out a little bit to look at it from a higher level. And then she began to see that there were actually some meta patterns uh, that were actually became eight general rules or eight uh, principles of uh, making for effective commons. In other words, the, the commons that were successful over time did eight things. Uh, and those that weren't either did less than eight things or none of the eight. So that was like a huge, huge breakthrough. So it's really important to understand when we're talking about the potential for creating commons, what some of these necessary success factors are. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll share those with you, if that'd be okay. Please do. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. Um, First of these is uh, the need to uh, define clear boundaries. So whether that happens to be a fishery, what part of a river or a coastal harbor uh, we're talking about, differentiating that from something else, or what part of a software code program, but to have some real clarity on what the boundaries are for the commons. Uh, the second thing Ostrom said is it's important to uh, match the rules for governing the commons to what the local needs and conditions are. In other words, you want to drive the commons as a principle, you want to um, have what's called subsidiarity. You want to have local decision-making at the lowest possible level.
to see if, if, if commons if, don't meet the needs of people locally, uh, then you know you have to wonder what's the purpose of them in the first place. So generally, having a viable commons, taking resources and, and creating a viable commons has to uh, benefit uh, people's lives altogether. I guess an example of, of that would be the, the Great Lakes Commons. Yes, yes, yes. Local people around the Great Lakes. Yeah, together. yeah, exactly. George is referring to a project that I'm involved with uh, and our university is involved with, uh, with the Great Lakes, creating the Great Lakes called the Great Lakes Commons Initiative. That the Great Lakes in the United States, the largest, to collect them all together, largest body of fresh water and surface fresh water in the world. In fact, it's 21% of the world's surface fresh water. So it's a precious, precious resource. And the Great Lakes are in deep, deep, deep trouble. Mm -hmm. And so even though there have been governmental and agency uh, agreements, it's been totally insufficient. And again, the collusion between the public sector with the regulations and what's going on in the private <coughs> sector, both mining industry, uh, water extraction industry, and so forth. And so the uh, initiative to declare the Great Lakes as a commons is very bold. It'll take many years. Uh, there'll be there are all kinds of legal challenges. Uh, but there are precedents going all the way back to Roman law that say that uh, water can thousands of years of legal precedent around that, uh, and uh, over time we've let that uh, slip away. Ostrom says also that we need to ensure uh, that those uh, who are affected by the rules can participate in uh, modifying the rules. say uh, we're together on a forest council in uh, Nepal and uh, we're responsible for overseeing the uh, management of this forest and we can determine how much wood we can take out of the forest and so forth, that we can modify these rules as necessary uh, depending on how conditions are uh, changing altogether. Um, and the fourth is that, it, and this is a tough one, uh, to uh, make sure, as much as possible, that the rules are uh, respected by relevant outside authorities. to uh, develop a system by those who are a part of the commons for uh, managing the behavior of those that use the commons. So again, if we have a fishery or even a pasture, uh, that there's some kind of way that we can monitor to say, George, you've got five cows on the pasture and it can only support four. Uh, so just like uh, they do in Switzerland, uh, you know, the, uh, the tops of the mountains in Switzerland are considered uh, commons. And so you can graze your uh, sheep, mountain goats, and cattle uh, on these tops of the mountains, but only under certain conditions. And so uh, it's really important that you're able to monitor uh, to make sure that everybody's playing by the rules that we're supposed to set, that we've agreed to. that gets into rule number six, is uh, Ostrom said that the commons that work best have um, a graduated use of sanctions. So 
So the first time you do it, you get a slap on the wrist. The second time you do it, you get a kick in the chin. The uh, third time you do it, you know, you're out of the game, or whatever it might be. And uh, seven is that there are uh, means for uh, dispute resolution that are accessible to people. So if we're all, um, uh, none of us have a lot of money and we have some disputes, that there's something that's affordable in terms of dispute resolution. You can just imagine, for instance, if people are managing commons in India and, and are more at a subsistence level, that uh, they're not going to be able to go and hire attorneys to uh, sort through any disputes. There must be mechanisms built into the commons where uh, people can do that. And uh, then the, uh, the last is, I'll just put it on here to keep it on one page, is to have um, to interlink uh, nested tiers of commons, and I'll explain what that means. But this has huge implications for where we are today in the commons movement. If, if we have a commons on um, part of a river, say it's uh, part of the Thames River that stretches for, I don't know, 20 miles or so that we're all concerned about. We have to recognize that that 20 mile stretch is part of a larger body of water that includes the entire river, but that also empties into another body of water that is uh, also a commons. And so there are successively greater and greater, uh, in this case, bodies of water that have certain kinds of requirements. And so we have to keep in mind uh, the fact that our management of this resource cannot adversely impact the next uh, layer up uh, altogether. And similarly, if, if we are, uh, we're operating at the next layer up, we can't do anything that impacts adversely uh, the next layer down. So Ostrom said, you know, these weren't her kind of suggestions. These were just, this is what she learned about commons that work and commons that don't. Um, so um, maybe I should just pause here and, yeah, George. I just want to make a comment that uh, you mentioned uh, and you are, when you were talking about uh, to define clear boundaries, you mentioned uh, occupy and uh, potential usefulness of principle and so because uh, some of us uh, here are also supporters of the Occupy movement I want to make uh, this uh, piece of information about a very interesting uh, essay that was published uh, on the website of the Future of Occupy with the title Sage Advice to Occupy question mark from Elinor Ostrom, <laughs> and uh, it was written by uh, one of our editors, uh, Mary Beth Steisminger, and what she did in that uh, essay, she took this eight uh, common design principles and wrote a commentary about the relevance mm. of each of them to the Occupy movement, and in a broader sense to any uh, social movement interested in making itself uh, sustainable and thriving. So the title is uh, Sage Advice to Occupy, question mark, advice from Eleanor Ostrom. And you can find it at thefutureofoccupy.org. That will be very important uh, because uh, talking about tragedy of common uh, I don't know if you've been to Finsbury Park, uh, Finsbury Square recently. It is a tragedy. 
because most many of these rules have been broken or ignored. So, uh, well, uh, we were just in a conversation uh, right before coming here, uh, George and Anna and another a colleague of ours, uh, where we were talking about the the necessity sort of double helix of when we talk about rights, whether it's rights of the commons or whatever, what goes along with rights is our responsibilities. And if the responsibilities are not upheld, then the, um, uh, the force of the rights uh, begins to really evaporate because the resource deteriorates or, or whatever. So this is really very, very important. So going back to your earlier um, uh, kind of uh, comment that, that, you know, 30 years ago, uh, the, the rise of kind of uh, philosophies of, of Thatcher and Reagan um, uh, put us on a different course. Um, when I was asking my earlier question, um, I guess I was thinking about, th this seems to be then a, a, I use a neutral word, conversation between forces that, that uh, you know, uh, support the private sector capitalism, uh, the market-based approach, and, and uh, the commons advocates. Um, so, I mean, is that, is, that your, is that your view? It's kind of a, a persuasive uh, the back and forth between the two, or is there something more fundamental that would, yeah. I guess, you know, how do you persuade people who, who supported those policies that, that this, is, this is not going, is it just a series of examples of where commons have produced uh, outcomes that we generally consider to be more favorable to, to, to our goals, or, or how yeah, does that work? Yeah, yeah. Uh, these obviously take uh, conversations, and there are some people that don't or won't ever sort of uh, get the point uh, to a certain extent. One of the facts that we're faced with today, uh, whatever side of a philosophical position we might there's some indisputable facts in terms of the environmental deterioration of the planet. Uh, the, and what we see is that the private sector alone, or the logic of the private sector, has not proven itself capable of resolving these uh, situations. And in fact, has in many cases made the, uh, some of the environmental tragedies that we see has made it worse. So uh, whether it's the exploitation of, of various kinds of natural resources or the polluting of unrestricted polluting air pollution as an example. Similarly, uh, the, the public sector, while in certain countries has attempted to regulate the private sector to deal with environmental issues. Uh, it's proven uh, incapable alone uh, as a group of, say, nation states to uh, come to any definitive conclusions around major global environmental issues. So uh, it's not a case, really, of, at this point in human history, of saying we don't need some kind of uh, governmental structures or that we don't need uh, markets, but that uh, rather it's the case of saying uh, there are, though, uh, a range of resources that um, should not be enclosed and that really do need to be protected for the for future generations, for the unborn. And many societies have had, in the past, traditions of what's called community law, which is different than civil law, where the rights of the unborn were uh, protected or taken into account in terms of how resources were uh, managed. And so today, what we see are, uh, we really need to have debates nationally and internationally with regard to what really should be the limits of uh, privatization. So uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. There was a student 
um, I teach graduate students that tend to be older. Um, this guy was a dentist, about 50 years old. And uh, he was telling me about two friends that he had who roughly at the same time got breast cancer. And they both a certain type of breast cancer that needed a special kind of treatment. And they, uh, a biotech company uh, said that it would supply the treatment uh, to them if they would sign these waivers and papers and this kind of stuff. So both of these women were under uh, terrible, stressful conditions, of course, and uh, signed these papers, which were very confusing, long, all this American legal stuff, you know, the whole bit. Um, and what they found was later that what they had, uh, what, what the papers contained is they were assigning the property rights of their breast cancer to the biotech company, mm -hmm. which then uh, patented the uh, breast cancer gene mm -hmm. and uh, used that patent to prevent, uh, at least in one case, uh, university research on this particular form of breast cancer, saying that it was a violation of their intellectual property. Now, the, the same thing's going on with the human genome, uh, where uh, biotech companies, pharmaceutical companies, are uh, patenting uh, everything they can relative to genetic code. And that if this uh, trend isn't, isn't stopped, there was a key court case in the United States that uh, is enabling, enabling this to happen. Hello? And Hello. if, if, if yeah. this doesn't stop, then within 20 years, all the genes that make up our species will be uh, privately owned. And these companies are also uh, patenting the genes uh, it's called gene prospecting of every form of uh, life that they can get their hands on, whether it's chimpanzees or, or, uh, or, or lions or, or herbs. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's like, hmm, uh, it seems like the private sector is a little out of control here. So nobody's saying that markets, we need to eliminate markets because then we'd have a hard time exchanging goods and services. But this isn't, this isn't obviously going So there really does need to be a conversation on how the role of these sectors can be subordinated in such a way that it enables uh, citizens in a society to flourish and to uh, be able to have a basic set of, uh, of human rights uh, altogether. And so the Commons offers a potential framework uh, for this uh, right now. Uh, and as it's explored and applied more and more, uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. I don't know if this is getting at your underlying question or, or not. Uh, I think I'm, you know, the, the, the thought's evolving kind of as we speak, so I'm yeah, not yeah. sure myself either. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, my, 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 my tendency is, and I, I certainly don't want to monopolize the conversation, so no, okay. I want to see if anybody else has anything to say before I... I mean, what's your main thrust that you're trying to work at? How, how, how do we persuade the people who don't believe that something has to change? Just I guess, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's sorry, a perfectly... Sorry, yeah, crude paraphrasing. Yeah, but no way of putting cause, it. Because, I mean, I, I, I completely share that question mark. I just share everything I find. I think I'm grateful my friends don't defriend me on Facebook because I share everything, especially the stuff that doesn't make the headlines that really should. If I pick up little articles that um, I feel shouldn't get buried in whatever has been decided is going to be the main five headlines today, you know, I just pass it on. So, and then people, I trust my friends to kind of make up their own minds. But I mean, I don't know, it's not, it's not enough, but it's, I guess it's one way we can share. And I think the more people hear about these stories, um, I haven't read the book yet, but there was a book published last year 
detailing a lot of what you were just saying about the um, patenting of genes, and I forget it's got this um, test tube of blood on the front. Mm. <laughs> so anyway, it's got a very striking cover, and it's yeah, I'm going to read that. But things like that, sharing you know all these stories because people don't realize, and I I'm guilty of it myself of always kind of assuming that um, a lot of these policies came into place purely out of good intentions. Do you see what I mean? That there aren't really people, I, I, and I think some people are very well intentioned who are making our policies and our laws, uh, but there are some who are just frankly pocketing the cash, you know, mm -hmm. just, and using the philosophical framework of the ethics behind policy making to kind of draw a veil over our eyes. Mm. I mean, that's just, it's just what I've started to, you know, the more I read, the more I'm thinking, you know, and I think it's not, I certainly, I'm a very positive person and I like to, I like to believe that everybody has good in them. So I'm not going around now fuming and thinking everybody's mm. evil, but I'm just saying, I just think, I think we need to realize that some people really are tricking us and conning us en masse, even very intelligent people, even academics. So it's, that's why I share stories, just so that other people realize actually, you know, there's something real, there's no smoke without fire mm. stuff going on. So I don't, I don't know, but that's Thank my you. feeling, I don't know. So um, and I think it's, in it. every time I go to an LSE talk, by the way, <laughs> um, especially the economists, who have been around for several decades and, they, and they're talking about the fundamental flaws in the laws of economics that were made, you know, decades ago. And um, I think they really believed that it, that it was all correct and right. And they did it, you can tell that they were part <coughs> of making them for good reasons, for the benefit of humankind. But somebody somewhere was going, ha, 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 they haven't realized that actually we've left out this fundamental calculation. Mm -hmm. Like, why have we not factored in the fact that, you know, we've assumed, I mean, the old economics law is that 100% of debt will be repaid. That's in all the calculations as far as I can tell. Uh, clearly, that's just not true. It's not even logical, but it wasn't picked up. Mm -hmm. Of course, a lot of people benefited who knew, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's just one example. Anyway, I just I think it's interesting, and I think people are waking up. So I guess I'm an optimist on this, but you know, we'll see. Sorry. Yeah. Go on. Please. Well, I, I was just going to say that last night I was at a group a meeting, um, at something called the Dana Center at, at uh, Imperial College, where um, there was a talk about um, the common common cause and how. Um, and I can't remember now any of, you know, my brain has gone to sleep and I cannot remember any of the actual names, but basically they were talking about what are the motivations behind uh, extrinsic and intrinsic um, motivations behind behaviour and that um, very, I mean, absolutely watertight research done over many years has shown that... Um, for example, that um, those people who have got have got money and want to go more to the um, acquisitive side uh, and get richer and so on, the less they will go for the more intrinsic values, like the commons, for example. Mm -hmm. However, it turns out that <laughs> the more you do the sharing, mm -hmm. the more you sit somebody down, so this comes back to getting together, mm -hmm. um, meeting, sharing, however it's done, those, that, that, those patterns, those values change. People will move towards those. The, the very people who were most anti, because it's individualization and riches and so on, is individualizing you rather than creating universality. The more that they will adhere or, or start taking on those, because actually those are universal values, deeply exactly. in hardwired, if exactly. you like. Exactly. And it's Very really interesting, and I'll send you the link. Yeah. Oh, exactly. I was sending them to Anna. I, I Anna's saw got it. them <laughs> and, and to Orphanania. Yeah. Uh, it's really to, worth it. Well done. Yeah, that's very important. To build on what you're saying, there's a, there's a new book, um, Penguin.
misspelled it. Uh, the so penguin you, yeah. and the leviathan. Mm -hmm. uh, by uh, Yokely Binkler. Which takes a look at a um, vast number of pipes. Tons of research in the behavioral sciences, the biological sciences, um, the physical sciences on uh, cooperation. And um, to build on what you're saying, is it Tina? Alex. 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 Mm -hmm. um, to build on what you're saying relative to uh, this uh, inherent predisposition to cooperation, and that we've had this uh, myth of enlightened self interest that has uh, actually governed and formed a lot of our institutions. And so we've had structures that have uh, structural limitations or that have inhibited cooperation. And if we could create systems that enhanced cooperation, uh, we would be even further along. Uh, uh, there is a, uh, I'm Leo, by the way. Tina. Oh, you're Tina. Yeah. Okay. Phoenix, <laughs> Alex, Cirrus, Anna, Mel, George, Janusz, and Tatiana. Tatiana. Okay, great, great. There is a uh, colleague who has a very interesting model of leadership, which gets at uh, some of these things that we're talking about, which is that what most of this is a change model leadership change model. When uh, What most of us do is uh, we tend to look at uh, issues. And uh, whether we're a manager in a company or a activist on the street or a uh, teacher in a school, uh, we're dealing with issues all the time. And so uh, one of the things that we try to do relative to the issues is um, address them and uh, get a certain kind of result. So if we have issues, we have an idea of what needs to happen, and we try to achieve a result. And this is where most of us spend a lot of our time all together. Uh, there are a couple of extra layers that we need to pay attention to that inform uh, what's going on here. And so, before showing that, most of us, as I say, look at our job and uh, try to develop our leadership skills to identify issues and achieve results by solving the issue of whatever it is. There are a couple other layers that are absolutely critical here. And one is the layer of uh, systems. And particularly, the, uh, there are systems that are seen and systems that are unseen. So there are visible systems and there are invisible systems. So uh, a visible system might be some form of infrastructure uh, that requires us to do things in a certain way. An invisible system might be something that we don't fully understand, whether it's the monetary system would be a good example, or a legal system or a system of intention around folks that you're talking about to try to thwart um, uh, public policy for their own uh, personal benefit. And so oftentimes we see that we'll have, even at a global level, we'll have an issue like policy or a poverty. Poverty is an issue. We'll try to address that and achieve certain kinds of results, but what we see year after decade after decade is uh, we don't make a lot of progress. Things might get a little bit better, then they get a little bit worse. A little bit better, a little bit worse. Well, what's going on? Well, there are, that's a tip-off, that there's something in the system, there are systems or forces that are countervailing uh, the results that we want to achieve to address the issues. And so if we're going to be effective in any kind of change initiative, that is defined in terms of issues, we have to, 
that be able to understand all the uh, both positive and uh, countervailing systems that are at work that uh, affect this. And so if, for instance, we see that we want to create a uh, commons as a solution to uh, making resources available to those that uh, most need it and want it, we have to understand the context in which that commons is trying to be created so that when we apply Ostrom's uh, principles, um, we This one of having rules re uh, respected by relevant outside authorities that we understand what kind of systems are in place uh, with these outside authorities. The third and last ring that uh, this colleague talks about, by the way, in systems, what we really want to do is to create alignment so that the systems support the resolution of the issues that we uh, uh, have identified. The, the third uh, ring really focuses on, you could say, our um, inherent values. So Alex, you're talking about the research that uh, suggests that humans, left to our own devices, we have this inherently altruistic and empathic drive that enables us to actually um, not only survive, but to thrive as a species. And that if this could be cultivated in various ways, then this would inform uh, everything that we do. And so uh, the extent to which these inherent values can be made uh, explicit and we can begin to feel into uh, the uh, deepest truth that we can comprehend and, and feel into our, really, you could say, our inherent indivisibility, we would have a very different view of what systems need to be modified and how we uh, frame and resolve these issues. And that the leader, the kind of leadership that's needed uh, these days are people that can address issues and get results, but who can also understand and shift uh, systems, but who live on the basis of a, a profound understanding that uh, humanity is a totality, and uh, the entire Earth is a living system that uh, we cannot uh, extract ourselves from. So I uh, didn't mean to divert us here talking about the commons, but it seemed relevant based on what you're saying, that the extent to which we can really intuit at a deep heart level uh, this, this necessity of cooperation because we really aren't separate from each other. Uh, that affects a whole set of possibilities on how uh, systems could support that. So for instance, just right now, uh, we have a colleague, George and I, and Anna too, uh, James Quilligan, and, and George talked at the beginning about a series of lectures James is going to be giving here in London in May, that uh, James has said, uh, with regard to the monetary system that we have, um, one of the most dreadful uh, aspects of this is interest, uh, the structure of interest around uh, fiat money, fiat currency. Uh, the interest is fundamentally uh, a cancer that uh, eats away at us because uh, if you think about it, uh, banks can create money through fractional reserve banking. Banks create money, but they don't create interest. We create interest through our time and our labor. And so as people are burdened with debt,
which is, you know, money's created through debt uh, in, in the current system that we operate. Banks create money when they lend money to us, so we've incurred the debt. We now have to repay the interest on that debt by extracting our labor and our time. Well, what does that do? That keeps members of society bound to a certain kind of ethos where their time and attention is uh, uh, really in bondage to a space-time continuum when much of life happens outside of space and outside of time, whether we're making love or uh, in some ecstatic appreciation of herbs uh, as an or whatever it might be. So, uh, and that's one reason why historically Religions have had uh, have said usury is a bad thing. Quilligan said, "What if we replaced interest rates with uh, sustainability rates? What if we took into a fact that we really are a unity? What would a monetary system look like? And so, could you have sustainability rates where the value of our currency would go up or down depending on the health of the earth at any given point in time?" And that those indicators were so sensitive it might help drive our purchasing decisions. Currently, we're a long way away from that, but with electronic money, uh, that'll be possible over the next decade if we have the willpower to do that. So all kinds of systems could shift that would enable a range of uh, different results to be achieved. Um, gee, how long? <laughs> yes. Oh, um, okay, I'll ask. Um, I just, I don't know whether there is a, 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 a view on taxation and whether it should, should be banned altogether or where, whether it can be used as a tool to, to get partly to where you want to be because uh, it's occurred to me very, very late in life but I've just been reading uh, Small is Beautiful uh, by Edward Schumacher and Never too stuff. late. Never <laughs> too late, I know, I had, I had my... <laughs> I had uh, a copy, actually, one of my parents gave to the other. Um, so anyway, it's great. But, um, and I just suddenly thought, and then it was the uh, same time as Mitt Romney was asked to publish his taxes for two years or something. Yeah, yeah. And I just thought, this is insane. People who make their money by labor in normal income and wages should be taxed less. And investment income should be taxed at the rate at which we are currently. It's like, wouldn't it just be so simple? <laughs> like, anyway, so it's taken me a while to get there, but I just... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, in a sense, we've got this massive moral hazard now. We are never going to get to where we want to be. Currently, obviously, if, if assuming we all still have to pay our taxes, who knows what the government order will be like. Well, so, so, years, so... But it's pretty crucial. Basically, what we're saying is this system by itself uh, we're seeing it has no capacity for self-correction. Mm -hmm. It has no capacity Especially for self-correction. Especially when it's being encouraged. I mean, so totally regardless, true. even if you know, even if he had yeah. uh, uh, politicians who weren't corrupt, uh, this alone cannot do it. And so there uh, is a, a framework with the issues that we've got today. This French seven billion people. This framework has to include an understanding of viable commons and the rules that make commons work, under what conditions you can claim sovereignty for commons, how you can create commons uh, that are sustainable. All of that has to be taken into account. Then you were talking about the interest rates and the sustainability rates. Uh, it's clear that uh, the sustainability rates uh, sounds more uh, wholesome, more uh, conducive to a fair and just society, but it seems to me uh, like uh, any model or any, any theory that uh, it will not happen by itself. Uh, it will take uh, powerful social movement to make it happen, particularly because you say that the private sector and public sector is unlikely that they are going to reform themselves. So uh, 
the movement of the commoners or, or Occupy needs to exercise pressure for that kind of major policy shifts uh, to, to happen. And uh, that leads me to the question about um, uh, politics as a commons. And I asked that question from Jane, James, because somebody in the Occupy Wall Street Forum on the Commons in that conversation asked the, the same question that uh, can um, the movement be a commons and how would it look like a commons based political action or political thought and uh, so when I had this conversation uh, about it with, with James he said no, he, doesn't, he doesn't think that politics is a commons or governance per se is not a commons. Political units or political movements can be commons because because of the of the emphasis on the resources. So uh, I would like to uh, dive a little bit deeper into because I'm involved uh, with the movement and I'm interested. Uh, how can it be informed? Uh, usefully meaning uh, get stronger from uh, being informed by commons uh, principle not about uh, politics but uh, the movement itself as a commons does it make any sense to you uh, yeah for sure uh, for sure because um, we obviously know we need new governance structures altogether um, we also know that certainly based on legal history in the United, in the, in the United Kingdom, uh, going, you know, way back, certainly to the Magna Carta, if not before, and, and we know even with certain amendments to the U.S. Constitution that uh, sovereignty rests not with uh, governments but with people really lost that. If you ask the average citizen, they, they assume sovereignty is a, is a function of the state. But it's not true. Okay. It's not. Huh? Yeah. The uh, extent to which there can be uh, commons methods employed that enable the uh, voices of citizens to be heard because in a commons, of course, as you know, it's, it's the active participation of those affected by the resource that begins to create uh, commoning. Mm -hmm. And so we have today in um, uh, political discourse has been uh, so limited that the voice of the average citizen is nowhere to be heard. If the Occupy movement is able to create frameworks or structures that enable people's voices to be heard in the midst of this, and then effective actions taken as a result of those voices, then there is uh, potential that a, uh, a political uh, process is, is being um, is, is, is reflecting uh, the very dimensions that commons call for. Mm -hmm. And frankly, if it doesn't happen, it, it, if it, it'll be interesting to see. If it doesn't happen with the Occupy movement, I think we may have to wait for a long time. Two questions. Um, one is on what you said about the sustainability rate, which is something that I'm sure a lot of people have been thinking. I've been thinking about it too. Uh, every time you know I eat something, I eat some sushi. You know, I'm trying to think what is the real cost of the rice in terms of right. water, right. And the tuna, and the food cycle, and the cucumber. Yeah. And it seems to me, I don't know, I can't wrap my head around how you go about calculating that, yeah. especially in, in a very dynamic kind of yeah. environment. Yeah. But you say that this is doable. Do you think this is? I think so. There's a colleague in uh, California uh, who 
who's working on something called the Ursula Project. You are? You, Elliot. Uh, yeah. Uh, that is looking at how you can use information technology to calculate the all-in cost of a good or service. But calculate what? The all-in cost. So uh, for a Tina Sushi, uh, theoretically, he hasn't got it all worked out yet, but he's got a basic framework that uh, you could on your iPhone. On your app or something. You'd have an iPhone app <laughs> that would enable you to, it might not get down to the exact restaurant, but uh, Sushi, UK, London, you know, what's the approximate cost of this? It also depends where it comes from, right? Because tuna from absolutely. particular place uh, yeah, not absolutely. Yeah, tuna absolutely. So but maybe that's a little far-fetched. Maybe he's uh, certainly looking at, you know, what's the cost of a gallon of milk in the United States? You know, something that's you can generally, he thinks you can measure. But doesn't that put you in the realm of markets rather than economies? I mean, if you're, if you're costing everything. How is it costing? I mean, it's, it's life cycle cost or, or complete yeah, cost. Yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm not saying that's a commons, uh, although the information is part of the knowledge commons that enables us to make different decisions relative to market purchases. Yeah which I thought was maybe where you were going. I'm not sure. Yeah. No, no, I was, I was talking about life cycle cost. Yeah, yeah, I was trying to see yeah. how, think how you cost that. Yeah, yeah. How you well, start. see, there are, there are multiple costs. There, I mean, costs. right, because there are, there are co cost of the water. I gave an example the other day in the talk. Uh, it was around the bottle of Fiji water. I was in Fiji giving this talk. Mm -hmm. uh, a liter and a half bottle of Fiji water that you buy at Whole Foods Market in Chicago. <laughs> uh, picking up that liter and a half bottle has taken, um, uh, the plastic alone has taken seven liters of water to uh, uh, actually fill that water in. It's taken almost the entire, it's taken one liter of fuel to uh, get that water uh, onto that shelf. When you put the all-in cost of the water, um, the, uh, you'd have a very different price on that. And one of the issues is that what happens is the private, what the private sector is able to do is it's able to externalize the cost, which means they're able to outboard uh, a lot of that cost. Uh, and oftentimes that's in the form of um, no charges on the pollution that the manufacturer that happens. Now, there's those kinds of costs, and then there are also the uh, human costs. I mean, how much blood are each of us wearing tonight, right? Uh, how many, you know, which children in which sweatshops were making the clothes that we're wearing? Uh, so. Or the iPhone, of course. The iPhone, yeah. Did you see the devastating article in the New York Times about. Uh, the suicides at the factory? The uh, suicides in the factory, yeah. yeah. Amongst other things. And you had a second question. Yeah, and also how do you go about costing a suicide? I mean, this is something, you know. Exactly. Um, well, there, there is a way to do it. The there is a way to do it, and the way to do it is not with the utility cost. The way to do it is to say, God damn it, that is wrong. It's just <laughs> wrong from a human perspective, mm -hmm. and I will not tolerate that. Mm -hmm. So I don't need to have a spreadsheet about that. It is wrong. And so how do we... Uh, so I stand for the fact that that's wrong. And how do you express that? You don't buy the shoe or whatever on the phone, mm -hmm. but what if you don't have the option and everyone is... Yeah, you know, yeah, going, yeah, yeah. Which is the case. So that's, that's part of the challenge of how do we uh, mobilize our uh, moral capacity uh, to take a stand that can create change. That's, isn't that one of the big questions before us today? And at a certain point, in, we were talking about this earlier today, at a certain point in Eastern Europe, people took a stand. Uh, when uh, at a certain point in the Indian Revolution, Gandhi, you know, you know, illiterate people in the untouchable class, they took a stand with Gandhi. And, uh, uh, and, and these moral forces congealed in a way that uh, those we're moving in a different direction back down. Can I 
I just, I mean, just on that point, you, you don't, you also don't have to be guiltless for your sharing of, of your outrage to still have pax and punch. If I can um, uh, draw the example of Greg Smith at Goldman's, you know, I mean, he, you know, he spent 12 years working there, and yet, you know, his letter is reverberating around Wall Street. His resignation letter talking about the ethics in the company culture there. So. Even if we've been forced to buy the iPhone or whatever, or the shoe, or you know, you can still say, you know, share with as many people as possible how upset you are that you, as a consumer, you felt you had no other choice than to be part of this chain. Um, and uh, I don't know, journalism, I guess, is important too. I found Panorama at various points in my life as a BBC program. They've been very good at uh, exposing. I don't think I would have heard of a sweatshop if I hadn't seen their program when I was a teenager and about Nike and Gap and stuff, so. Uh, yeah, you know, and, the, and the, you know, even, it's clearly in reaction, um, uh, Apple created a new industry standard after mm -hmm. that article came out in mm -hmm. terms of uh, inspection of uh, outsourced factories. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you could say their motivations are from a PR point of view. I was actually talking with my daughter about, oh, wouldn't it be interesting to create an iPhone app that you could uh, donate money through the app to uh, offset the, uh, to pay to the families 